We are starting today, though, by taking a look at the chip space after the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, also known as TSMC, raises its Arizona chip investment to $40 billion. That coming amid plans to build a second semiconductor factory. All of this comes ahead of President Biden's visit to TSMC's current plan under construction in Arizona. And we should point out, Rochelle, this isn't just any visit by the president. You're going to have Tim Cook from Apple, Jensen Huang from NVIDIA, executives from AMD, all the major chip makers who reportedly really pushed TSMC to consider the second option here. There's already one plant underway. It went from $12 billion investment to $40 billion. And the president really here to kind of tout what his administration has been pushing all along, which is to onshore production, manufacturing of chips in the U.S. And you see the results so far. No question the president's going to be touting all of this in terms of the investments he's been able to line up under his administration as a counter to China, Rochelle. And it's interesting because we saw commentary from Ronnie Chatterjee, the National Economic Council member who's actually overseeing the CHIPS Act. And he actually said that at scale, these two factories could meet the entire U.S. demand for U.S. chips when they're completed. That's the definition of supply chain resilience. We won't have to rely on anyone else to make the chips we need. But keep in mind that the raw materials that actually go into the chips predominantly are mined in Russia, China and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Obviously, there's a competitive relationship with China current sanctions on Russia and the Democratic Republic of Congo experiencing some active conflict in there at the moment. So in terms of supply chain resilience, I think that does come with a caveat for sure, but we'll be keeping an eye on that. In fact, joining us now for more on the chip conversation is Stacey Rasgone, Pernstein Research U.S. Semiconductors and Semicap Equipment Senior Analyst and Managing Director. Thank you for joining us. So I want to first get your takeaway. How, how much of a victory lap should Biden be taking at this point? I, look, it's it's important. The whole point of the CHIPS Act is to try to get some of these advanced projects and, and, and frankly, even some of the non-advanced projects started here in the U.S. versus started elsewhere. I, I do think it's important to put this in context. So these numbers sound really big. They're actually not that big. Like even if TSMC is making whatever it is, 600,000 wafers a year in 26 out of this facility, that's about 50,000 wafers a month. That's like, it'd be like 3% of their total installed uh, manufacturing capacity at that point. Um, the numbers in semiconductors in general get mind-bogglingly big. <laughs> um, these numbers in the grand scheme of things are not incredibly big, but but they are a start, right? It is it is important. I think it's 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 interesting and very important that they don't just have Biden, but as you mentioned, they do have Tim Cook and Jensen and and the CEOs of of the customers that are going to use these facilities, right? These things are very expensive. You don't want to build them unless you're sure that you can fill them. Looks like TSMC is probably not going to have that much problem filling it once it gets built. Uh, Stacey, good to talk to you this morning. You know, it's kind of worth sort of backing, backtracking here and looking at how the events have all lined up. Obviously, there was the CHIPS Act that passed over the summer. And then in October, some of the most stringent export controls that were placed on Chinese manufacturing actually disabled American companies largely from uh, providing advanced chips. I wonder if yeah. we can speak to what we're hearing out of TSMC. It's not just five nanometer chips. We're talking about more advanced chips, four to three nanometer. How significant is it that they're expanding in that direction now? It, it is, but by the time that stuff comes online, it's not going to be like bleeding edge anymore. So, so the, remember, there, there's two facilities that they're talking about building now. The site, by the way, is sized for like six fabs. So they're starting with two. The first fab looks like it's been upgraded from what was called five nanometers to four. They're roughly the same. They use the same kind of equipment set. Four nanometers is kind of an upgraded five, but fine. Um, by the time it comes online in 24, that's not going to be leading edge. The new fab is, looks like it's going to be doing three nanometer in 26. And again, by the time that comes online, that will not be the most advanced stuff. TSMC is doing a two nanometer fab in, in Taiwan. They're already talking about doing a one nanometer fab. Um, so they will not be the bleeding edge of what TSMC is doing. They're going to keep that, it sounds like, in, in Taiwan. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not important, right? Even even the the stuff that's not on, on the, the true bleeding edge of process technology is still needed. And so what's next in terms of where the industry goes from here? Obviously, we're starting to see some of the benefits of the CHIPS Act starting to pour in, but it's still very early days at the moment. That, that That's right. And, and again, so remember, the, the CHIPS Act is going to take a while. Uh, there's there's a couple of different pieces of it. You have the direct manufacturing subsidies. I think it was $52 billion in total, which included $39 billion for directly for manufacturing. 
the the proposals for that stuff are not even really going to start coming in until you know the first half of next year and the funds will be dispersed over like the next five to ten years so it's going to take a while i think if you look at the uh the, the cbo the congressional budget office they were estimating 2026 is probably the peak year for fund disbursement and it was something like 10 billion dollars in that year and just for some context the industry spends anywhere between you know 70 and 100 billion dollars a year on on equipment right now so it's they're 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 relatively small as a percentage of the total um there's also tax credits that happen the, the tax credits can happen quicker it's a 25 percent tax credit on qualified u.s uh, manufacturing investments in semiconductors i think the cbo had estimated that at about 24 billion dollars over the lifetime of the pro of that program which was five years so these are the kind of numbers that we're talking about but just for some context tsmc spends close to 40 billion dollars a year just for themselves the industry as a whole the global industry i mean we did in 20 this year in 2022 we'll probably do 95 billion dollars in equipment spending and probably 140 150 billion in, in billion in total capex for semiconductor industry. so that just gives you some idea of the kind of numbers we're talking about here uh, stacy really quickly you said in terms of volume this isn't significant but uh, this is really a, a critical piece of at least this administration's pushback against China. And I'll I want to point to comments that we got from Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo last okay. week, uh, who has really been leading this push, who said semiconductors are ground zero in this technological competition and central to our new investment strategy. Obviously, she goes on to talk about how the U.S. has lost the lead in terms of global production. Um, what does this do, the announcement today, TSMC being a Taiwanese company, announcing this in Arizona, what does that mean for the larger U.S.-China competition? Well, so I still don't believe that the U.S. has given up on semiconductors, although I think uh, the secretary is right. In terms of manufacturing, we've let manufacturing go offshore. There are many other critical pieces of the semiconductor industry that, that the U.S. controls. And by the way, the sanctions on China are, are clear evidence of that. We, we've chopped their knees out from under them in terms of their own ability probably to develop a, 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 an advanced semiconductor industry on their own. We own the, the most important design companies. We own the most important, some of the most important equipment companies. We own the most important, uh, what's called EDA, the software design companies that, that make the software to do this stuff. Um, there are many, many, many pieces of the of, of the supply chain. It's a very global and very interconnected supply chain. And the US controls um, uh, big pieces of that. So I don't think it's true that we've given up on, on semiconductors or that we've left the lead, quote unquote, go. Manufacturing, yes, and, and and I think it is important to bring that back on short, to try to bring some of it on short to de-risk. But you'll never be able, for example, to fully reshore what's in Taiwan. It'll take trillions of dollars in 20 years, um, if if that, if, if it's possible at all. And there's always going to be pieces of the supply chain that are critical that we that we can't control. But all that being said, I, I think the more diversification you have is important. It is very true that that the U.S. And, and frankly the world is very dependent on Taiwan, and it's 100 miles offshore from China, and that's becoming an increasingly um, untenable geopolitical situation. And so, any kind of like strategic diversification we can do for that supply chain, I think, is important. And this is a start. That's all it is. It's only a start, but you have to start somewhere. Um, and this is a good start, I think, uh, um, along those lines. Fair point. A strong start indeed. A big thank you to Bernstein, Stacey Rascone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.